All right, guys, uh, I guess I'll get this going. Uh, Koshika, my phone's in the back. Could you turn the volume off? It's right behind you. So I guess you guys are wondering a little bit, why does this weird guy have sunglasses on? Long story short, I left my glasses at the office, so I cannot see without them. You know, so, you know, I, I could be a rapper. You wouldn't be able to tell, but you know, we're all in here together. Uh, so. This is, this is not going to be a rap concert. Uh, we're going to be talking about blockchain and enterprise. Uh, we've got two really nice speakers here today. We've got Leonard, who's graciously joined us from IBM, uh, as well as Koshik, who's currently uh, the CTO over at Redex, which is a blockchain and real estate company. Um, so just to give you guys a little bit of background, I'd like to thank Hacker Dojo for allowing us to have host our event over here. Uh, they have quite reasonable prices on co-working if you're looking for any sort of co-working spaces. Um, 125 a month, right? Not bad. Free coffee, free water, electricity, air, you know. So, um, yeah. So, coming back to a little bit about who we are. Uh, we're the DEN, the Decentralized Education Nexus. Long story short, we're a global workforce accelerator. So what that means is that we work with uh, individuals as well as organizations such as universities to bring this sort of blockchain education to the mainstream. Um, we've kind of identified that there are two different types of people in the space right now. There are people who are more interested on the enterprise side of things as well as there, there's people who are interested on the enterprise side of things as well as kind of like decentralizing the world. Um, so we've run a few different tracks. We've got a blockchain for developers course after three different iterations, uh, we've got it down. It's a 14 week long part-time course to really get you up to date on how to build out dApps uh, for any sort of like public chain. Uh, we use Ethereum essentially as the vessel to teach out the architecture. However, it, those concepts can be applied towards any other sort of chain. Um, beyond that, uh, just one last plug as well. Uh, we will be starting a Hyperledger course uh, focused towards the public as well as for uh, enterprise companies who are looking to train their developers. Uh, not only do we help with the kind of education aspect of things, but we have something that's really cool, which we call CoLab Labs, where essentially students from our business courses as well as students from our engineering courses come together to actually build out MVPs. So if anyone is looking to build out an MVP if or have any idea for a POC or, or something like that that they want to build, please do come reach out to me afterwards. Uh, we are very interested in that. Um, if you have any other questions, uh, please feel free to ask me. Uh, we've got Elliot in the back. We've got Christopher over there, uh, Alok, uh, as well as I think Zoe as well. So we've got we've got a, quite a good uh, group of friends here today from the Den. Um, so, without further oh, okay, and really quickly, we we recently just partnered with uh, UCI uh, Extension. So. Uh, if, since you guys all live here, I don't know how, how relatable it is to you, but uh, it, it's something that's really cool. Uh, so I'd like to introduce uh, Edward from the Tech Futures Group. Uh, uh, the Tech Futures Group, oh, there he is. Okay. He can talk about it. Hello, Edward. Hello, everyone. Hi, I'm Edgar with Tech Futures Group. Jerry is actually not here today, but he's the director. I'm the associate director. So. Um, Oh yeah, so uh, very quickly, we're a nonprofit that offers 100% free business advice to tech companies. We're actually funded by the federal government and the state government. Um, companies that benefit from us the most are companies usually in the early stage, have a team built out, um, their product is in beta or better, and they're actually in the early stages of fundraising, either with um, looking at government grants or seed stage fundraising. All we do is offer just free business advice. We take no equity, no cash. We don't have um, office space to offer. We don't have a fund. Um, we don't have any programs or trainings. And there's no limited time. So once you're a client, you're a client for as long as you're uh, an existing business. All we are is just great advisors. So the way it works is we actually pay a set number of hours of advisors' times to work with companies for free. This is just a little bit of what the advisors focus on when they're helping companies. Uh, Go-to-market strategies, manufacturing, private financing, financial modeling, and government grants. Uh, we're measured on three things. 
So we're measured on the ability to help companies raise money through government grants and private equity, uh, jobs, and revenue. The way it works is companies apply online, we review it, application, then we pass it along to a potential prime advisor to help you out with any pitfalls that you're facing. You are, usually clients are the center of our world and around them are main advisors. And these are, uh, I guess, supplement advisors that come in as needed. Patent attorneys, manufacturing, uh, financial modelists, and government grant specialists. So this is just a few of our, I guess, biggest wins. We've been around since 2012. And um, since then, we've helped companies, about 130 companies raise over $100 million, which we took nothing of, 100% free business advice. So my name's Edgar. I'll be in the back. If you guys have any more questions, I'll be happy to answer anything. But if you guys are willing to apply, definitely feel free. Thank you. All right, hey guys, I'm Kushik. Um, I'm going to be talking more about why blockchain is, needs to be implemented in enterprises, and Leonard is going to be talking about more and the what needs to be done and how it's going to be implemented. Um, so a little bit about myself. Well, I'm currently the co-founder and head of engineering at Red X, and what we do, we're uh, implementing Hyperledger Fabric to tokenize real estate assets so you can you can trade them like in shares or stocks virtually. Um, and I'm also a blockchain consultant at um, Blockchain Educators. What they're doing is they're basically going to enterprises and uh, they're consulting for them, doing POCs or MVP projects for them. And currently, this is why you guys are all here, I am the Hyperledger instructor for the DEN. So, before we actually dive into why blockchain is needed for enterprise, let's actually let's make a very valid case and clarify anything. What is a EA? What is an enterprise application? And we're, through that, we're going to discover why it's necessary for blockchain to be there. So just a summary, that's just a bunch of words, but let's take some key takeaways from it. So a EA is basically complex, right? Usually enterprises applications are humongous, whether it's for healthcare, retail, or any return CRMs. So let's, and it's scalable, right? So, and that's the thing I highlighted in bold, because usually when you think about blockchain, one of the biggest negative effects you hear around and around is basically blockchain is not scalable. It's too expensive on the IT infrastructure. Um, and basically, is it really necessary for an EA to be used for a business case? Um, and another thing I talked about is mission critical, right? So mission critical means it needs to be stable at all times. Limit the number of times it's run down in production environments, right? And right now, you may think, you know, blockchain's very young, right? Is there any mission critical applications out there that enterprises actually use for? And we're going to observe that um, in the coming slides. So, and this is actually a funny story. And you guys could uh, look at the meme. Um, let me walk away. So, a funny story is this is actually real life. Uh, when I do blockchain, when I consult for enterprises, literally, when I go into innovation team, usually everything in enterprise right now is on innovation for blockchain, R&D teams, right, for enterprises. This is a real life conversation, not verbatim, but basically around there. So you have a head guy, CIO or uh, CTO of an enterprise, and then he talks to one of his lead innovation R&D engineers and he goes, you know, we should have blockchain. And then he's like, okay, blockchain, I heard the term before, but how would it suit our business use case? And that's the question most enterprises are not answering correctly. And the few enterprises that are answering it, they're getting huge returns on investments. Um, this is actually a real life story. I talked with Walmart director, and this is how it went, and this is how I got the contract. I just said blockchain. They're like, okay. Okay, so now, DT, right? How many of you guys are familiar with DT in enterprises? Right, so if you want to be a CIO, 
or management. Use DT, you'll probably get the promotion. Right, so what the heck is DT, right? Um, previously, I worked at Cole's R uh, innovation team, basically R&D, and when I walk into the office, a big poster is this DT, digital transformation. They have some buzzwords in there, and I'm like, what the heck is DT? And I'm just really young, and, it, and I got to notice, DT just basically means don't get disrupted, right? If your company is disrupted, it's on your ass, basically. It's the guys who's leading the technology. All right, this is a meme I got. It's like, yeah. It's the worst case scenario for a CIO or anyone in director at enterprises. If you get disrupted, you're basically, it looks really bad on you. So, and this is one of the key um, use cases for blockchain, healthcare, and it actually fits very well with it. So if you think about healthcare, I don't know how you guys are familiar with healthcare and enterprises. Is anyone works in healthcare enterprise? All right, cool. So you would know there's a huge, huge bureaucracy, right? From getting the t uh, medicine from your hands to your pocket, from ordering it online, like how Kaiser does it through mobile applications, actually meeting, scheduling an appointment with a doctor requires a huge IT infrastructure in the back end, right? And you may be thinking, you know, why is that? Why isn't it healthcare scheduling an appointment with a doctor? Why isn't it ordering a medication? Why isn't it simple, like ordering a food service? Well, uh, thank thankfully for U.S. citizens, we have something called HIPAA, or in the U.S., right? Uh, that's one of the key concepts where where the government actually does a good job protecting our data. HIPAA is so bureaucratic that it, there's a huge industry around it, HIPAA as a service, HIPAA tools. And what we're noticing is blockchain as a whole, using frameworks like Hyperledger, um, R3, or any other blockchain tools, it actually makes it all into one ecosystem. So at the end of the day, you're actually saving a lot of money. And I'm going to go to a use case later on. So yeah. As I just mentioned, what's the real use case for uh, blockchain and HIPAA? Um, for real healthcare is HIPAA, and specifically HIPAA is huge, right? So it's privacy and security standards. Blockchain just solves that immediately. Go to, this is probably the hugest number one use case right now for enterprise uh, blockchain. And how many of you guys worked with any kind of software application to track supply chain? All of you. You guys know the headache it causes, right? It's a huge monument task, and there's a lot of players in the game that create a lot of businesses for all the head headaches, right? They solve like all the headaches. And the four key points that you do when you do supply chain management as any kind of application tool is you have to collect the data. Um, you analyze the trends, the trends of like when items go from point A to point B. And you also do prediction monitoring. And you do this, and the last one, it's extremely important. Safety is, I said produce safety, but it should be general safety. The quality of the product moving from point A to point B, that's the goal of the supply chain management. Everything, the first three is just extra, right? That should be your first um, use case or your attribute for how a really good supply chain is to make sure the product that's being transferred is in good quality from the ordered. So, and this is what Walmart is doing right now. How many of you guys heard about what Walmart is doing so successful in blockchain? All right, cool. Cool, okay. So let me give you a backstory of what Walmart's doing. So when I went to blockchain educators, um, I got to interact with the Walmart team. And Walmart's, if you look at Walmart's, what's Walmart's main competitor? Amazon, right? And what's Walmart, what does Walmart have advantage over Amazon currently right now? Well, Amazon can sell shoes, uh, anything that's like not produce, right, basically. I know Amazon has Amazon Fresh, but still Walmart's basically destroying them in the produce section. So if, if Walmart wants to keep its place in the produce section, 
they need to keep the quality up. Because the only reason you go to Walmart to actually go inside the store, you pick the banner up, because you can validate the quality of the produce, right? In Amazon Fresh, you're like, okay, guy, some guy delivers it to my house, how do I know it, right? So they want to leverage the pro produce quality of their stuff. So what they actually did was, their goal is to track food, and this is actually implemented right now in Walmart infrastructure. Track food from a farm to the store in real time using blockchain technologies. Now, that may sound very simplistic, right? And I asked before, how many of you guys are in uh, supply chain management or ever, ever been in supply chain management? And there's one thing that supply chain has right now, and that's very powerful. Basically, IoT, right? I put a cell phone up there, it's basically IoT. Anything that connects to the internet is IoT, right? So what I mean by IoT is what Walmart is doing right now is if you put a crate of bananas in the truck, there's actually a machine that measures the weight. There's a machine that measures the temperature of the bananas. There's a machine that measures almost anything that you want from a regulation standpoint. And how do you collect all the data from a machine and you put it in one basically immutable database or any blockchain attributes in it. Well, you do that easily through basically blockchain technologies. And I, um, Walmart is using IBM support through Hyperledger Fabric. IoT block, supply chain, as I said. And this is huge right now. So in enterprise, what's the one thing, you guys work in enterprises, I presume, um, what's the one thing where you guys seen from the last 10 years to now, right? It's the cloud, right? Cloud, okay, and this is a great analogy made by me by um, one senior manager, Robert Half, and I was talking to him and I'm like, I'm like, so from a young person, I never developed something without the cloud, personally. Everything I developed was basically on the cloud. I thought cloud was how people did it back in the day. And he told me this one thing, he was like, you know, let me tell you a story. Back in the day, we treated servers or mainframes or what we call it as our pets. We took care of it. We, we made sure it doesn't get destroyed. We fed it properly. Now, we treat them like cattle. We destroy it whenever we have the chance because cost efficiency is our thing. Nothing's on premise anymore. It's extremely hard unless this business requirement requires it. So that's extremely important for enterprise adoption, right? Blockchain. And this picture is not clear, but there's one player in the game that covers it. Um, Hyperledger Fabric. And you might want to presume, who backs Hyperledger Fabric up? Um, it's IBM, Mr. Mean, old school enterprise guy. Um, he backs it because he, they, and Hyperledger Fabric is actually going to learn more about Leonard, but it's actually open source, right? And that's a good thing because um, I'm sure you guys all know, what does IBM do really good? They start really great products. Where do they mess up? They give up on it. Um, but this is under uh, Linux Foundation, so it's open source. The whole community contributes on it. And IBM is actually leveraging that on their cloud servers, and they're making sure like uh, other cloud services are actually on it. So let me summarize this real quick. So we talk about Hyperledger, right? And this is not, not clear, my apologies. There's other popular frameworks for enterprises. The second is huge, right? You guys learn about Ethereum, right? Um, I don't want to say anything bad about Ethereum just because I might get shot here. Uh, a lot of people invested time, money, and resources in Ethereum. Um, but yeah, so I say it's a private blockchain network. It can be, pri uh, there's some frameworks out there that are based on Ethereum that can be a private blockchain. Um, but the main Ethereum is not, so. And there's multi-chain, an open platform for building blockchains. Um, have you guys learned about R3, which is really interesting right now, which is actually taking off in Europe? Uh, anyone heard about R3? Yeah, so R3 is really smart, because what they did was when they're building a blockchain out, they made sure to get the biggest guys 
in enterprises. So if you look at their board of directors, everyone in R3 is basically in the reg board, like most of them are in the reg board of any government. So the only competition I can see from my standpoint that can compete with Hyperledger right now is R3, just because of the connections they have. All right, and I know I, I hyped up Hyperledger a lot. Um, this is, and I'm gonna put a plug in here just from a selfish standpoint. Um, so you can see from Hyperledger standpoint, massive adoption taking place, right? We talk about BAS, right? Blockchain as a service. What cloud services are actually providing Hyperledger support? Basically all the major supports taking place other than one guy and we don't know why. No one in the blockchain world knows why they're not doing it. And that guy is Mr. Google. And I don't know why Mr. Google does not want to come on the blockchain train. Uh, they may be secretly doing R&D on their own blockchain and not supporting on GCP. But other than Mr. Google, there's one blockchain framework, as I stated previously, that has support in all cloud services, and that's Hyperledger, specifically Hyperledger Fabric, right? Um, from that standpoint, when I take a look at enterprise adoption, right, I take a look at this metric. The number one metric I take a look at is cost, right? Cost, right? Because I don't think enterprises actually care about the quality as long as the cost is good and it's mediocre. Um, from there, from a hyperledger fabric standpoint, if you have a lot of competitors offering the cost service, well, the cost is going to go down. It's easily adaptable. Um, and another thing I like to take a look at is connections, right? Usually in enterprise sales, you guys know, does it really, you guys can answer this, actually I don't want to answer this, who wins a contract in enterprise sales? Does the best product win? Or the guy with the best connections? Connections, right? And unfortunately in technology, as I'm learning, it's not about meritocracy. Um, so Hyperledger Fabric is heavily invested by IBM. Oracle, their whole cloud boss blockchain as a service on Oracle platform is Hyperledger. Um, AWS just introduced on AWS reInvent. I don't know if you guys all went to Las Vegas or AWS reInvent. They're supporting Hyperledger now. And their own blockchain they're doing it is still in R&D is based off Hyperledger. So all the big enterprises are putting all their engineers into the Linux Foundation, and they're developing on Hyperledger, specifically Hyperledger Fabric. So that's why I advocate how can you master Hyperledger? Because I presume you guys want to increase your career, learn more, that's like technology comes and goes, right? The real skill is how do you identify the technology that's going to last? And that's the real skill, right? And it's near impossible. And um, by looking at the attributes I stated before, I can t definitely tell you, in my opinion, Hyperledger is going to stick around. And you can master it through, I think, Sarag just stated that we have an eight-week developer course. Um, we really, what we're trying to do is we're trying to bring the industry into it. So um, maybe like once a week we have panel night with like Oracle blockchain head and then we will probably have someone with IBM talking about it. So yeah, so do you guys have any questions about where you guys see enterprise and blockchain taking place? Any questions at all? Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, exactly. I think Elliot is right there. He's uh, more into the protocol as so Elliot, would you like to answer?
yeah, okay. I, I don't think that's a conversation this whole audience should listen to. Yeah. Okay, so I'm presuming you're talking. So I think Leonard's going to talk more about the Hyperledger Foundation and I mean Linux Foundation. So you can think about Hyperledger as a as a name for the type of framework, and underneath it is all these frameworks, right? And I'm not familiar. Is are you talking about Hyperledger Stella? Or Stella. I'm not sure about Stella, so I don't want to answer that. So. It's a public. It's a public blockchain. Is it underneath the Hyperledger? It's not. Yeah, I don't. I don't want to talk about something I don't know. So, I'm a specialist in Hyperledger. Only. Yeah, so um, first of all, no one gave me the authority to speak about this. No, I, I'm, jo I'm, I, no I'm, I'm just joking, I'm joking. Um, y yeah, yeah, so um, let me speak more vaguely about the answer. And personally, from my standpoint, was I the guy who convinced Walmart to, bro, you should totally implement blockchain for your lettuce? No way. I was there more in the director role about specific tracking, right? So, um, and Leonard can talk more about this. Maybe he's the right person to answer this. You talk about time frame, right? So, usually it took, it took them two years, I presume, I presume two years from um, creation of the POC plan, functional requirements, all the way to implementation. And the reason I say this is because if you look at Hyperledger Fabric, right, basically 1.0 is less than a year old. Right. So, I mean, around a year old or less than a year old. And 1.0 is basically the development um, fabric. Yeah, yeah, so um, from that standpoint, it might have been really hard if they did more than two years from implementation. And just basically the, and one thing I forgot to talk about is why should learn Hyperledger Fabric is taking off, right? And the one thing you learn about is in my company, we, we do consultants, uh, we hire consultants from Oracle, right? And the biggest challenge we have is skill set. And which questions like my idea, how does Oracle hire blockchain developers? Um, these guys come in and they charge a hefty fee and they can't deliver on time. So what we're trying to do at the den is actually give you guys the right criteria and skill sets that applicable and you guys can take off from there. So thank you. Thank you. So this is me, Leonard Francel from IBM. I'm a developer advocate working with blockchain, covering most of the US, and I'm one of many, several dozen developer advocates. And we're here to tell you what we think about blockchain and what we IBM is doing with it, but also to hear what you think about our stuff and what you think about the world in general, and take it back to development. This may be the most important chart I will show you. It's a very boring chart, but it tells a very important story. Koshik talk, talked about this and um, introducing Hyperledger Fabric 1.4 LTS. What does that mean? Long-term support. This means that Hyperledger Fabric is now mainstream and you can use it for, severe, so for, for, to, for real applications, real enterprise applications. Before that 1.1, 1.2, 1.3 was just beta alpha and beta, now it, is in, it has hit the mainstream and you can write any kind of applications you want to in Hyperledger Fabric. This is a very, very important statement. How it started, I'm not gonna go through this again, but it started in October 2008. If you haven't read this, chart, this um, URL, bitcoin.org, bitcoin.pdf, do so because that tells you everything you want to know about where bl blockchain and Bitcoin come from and what they, the problems they're trying to solve. So this is a very, very important URL here. In December 2015, Linux Foundation started the Hyperledger umbrella 
here with the number of hyperledger, hyperledger applications, borough fabric in the Eroa sawtooth, and then tools to further, sound, further down. And these were now silos. They didn't talk to each other. They, didn't, they were kind of competing with each other. And that is now changing big time. Now everything is about collaboration and working together. This is a major change for Hyperledger. And also there is now an app layer. Have you heard of TradeLens? This is one of the enterprise applications that we're gonna talk about. The way you write applications in Hyperledger is that you go to one of these frameworks, say Fabric, you use some of the tools, and you create something that you then uh, put in the app layer. The app layer is not part of Hyperledger, but it's written in Hyperledger code, if that makes sense. So we have trade lens digitizing the global supply chain, and I'm gonna, cover, I'm gonna uh, dovetail with Kashyyyk. Supp it's supply chain, supply chain, supply chain. That is the most important uh, segment now for blockchain in the world, and I'll explain why that is so important. Have you heard of Hyperledger Sawtooth supply chain? Well, you have now, and that is very, very important. That is very, very important. The reason is that Hyperledger Sawtooth supply chain is part, of Hyper, is part of Hyperledger. It is not something written in Hyperledger, it's also part of Hyperledger. It's being supported by, by the Hyperledger organization. Something that is not the case with Tradelands. We're gonna see more and more of these um, applications coming into the app layer, written in Hyperledger and supported by Hyperledger. And in this case also by Car Cargill, the large US uh, food company, creating large applications for the supply chain that you can just take off the shelf, tweak some knobs, and you have an application. And you have an enterprise application, not just an ordinary little one, but a big one. So this is, this is a step in the, in the right direction and you're gonna see much more of this coming in the next, next two years. Also, we now support Ethereum. This is another enormously big step that we are making use of Ethereum's smart contracts. You can now use the smart contract from Ethereum in Solidity in Hyperledger Fabric. If that doesn't freak you out, nothing will. This is big, this is really, really big, because before they were, they were two different worlds, now the two worlds have joined together, and you can begin to write applications you never could write before, because you can take bits and pieces from one framework, into, integrate them into another framework, and then create uh, something really brand new. This is a trend that will continue, trust me, you're gonna see much, much more of this this year. And therefore, it doesn't matter what, what smart contract language you use. You can use one in the other place and the, uh, in another framework and in another framework and use another one. This is really, really, really important. When you architect your app, the first thing you do is that you go to an IBM website called Blockchain Use Cases. You can see the URL there and you'll get these charts, by the way. We have, we have uh, uh, collected 30, 40, 50 maybe, use cases. So if you want to write something now, you don't just begin to think about, hmm, what am I going to write? You go and get the use case off the shelf and re-implement that thing. That's a very, very important point. We're trying to make everything as simple as possible for everybody here. Reuse, reuse, reuse. All open source, all reuse. Do not sit down and, and, and try to in innovate at this level, because this level has already been innovated. You can innovate, and I'll show you how, where you can innovate later. And again, it's supply chain, supply chain, supply chain, supply chain is the leading segment for blockchain applications. And I'll explain why that is later. You've seen this picture or something similar where we have all the particip participants in the network working together. If they are working together, then, then it's good, a good for a blockchain solution because then they can, they can all use the same ledger and the ledger in this is then shared replicated, permissioned, with consensus, provenance, immutability, and finality. So again, if you have a number of companies working together, we each one has their own ledger. Ledgers are boring, but in this case, they are kind of exciting. And they all have working together, and they all have their own ledger. Then you can in implement them in blockchain much, much more efficiently, because they can share the same ledger. 
This is the big step from in independent ledgers to, f to simple uh, a shared ledger is a big step. If you can do that, then you can go for blockchain. Otherwise, probably not. It's very, very simple. You can think of it really as an accountant would. One ledger or many ledgers. What do you prefer? And, and you prefer one ledger because then everybody has to agree to put data on the ledger before they can do so. Blockchain developer roles. This also is very important. You may not be able to read this, but you need an architect. You need a couple of developers, a network operator, and then you need traditional data sources, and I'll tell you what that is, and a few other things. You need quite a big team here. I would say five people is the smallest team you need with skills in cryptography, networking, and a number of other areas as well. So this is not something that is easy to start, and you should be, you should be aware of the fact that this is, this is something where you have to have really good skills. This one we can go through later, and this one is chain code. This is a very important chart as well. When you want to architect your application, there are lots of, lots of things you have, to, you have to realize, you have to think about, you have to be aware of that you may not have thought of because they have not been documented. The one thing is the amount of data being shared. So people are saying, as Kashik said, let's put it on the blockchain. So for instance, we have the example of an, a, a medical application. And we all have x-rays taken of uh, ourselves. So then if you're a radiologist, you say, I can put the x-rays on the, on the blockchain. And that is the wrong answer. Why is that the wrong answer? Why would you never put an x-ray on the blockchain? Unless you are really, really weird. It's too big, exactly. It would br bring the blockchain to a, ho to a screeching halt. You can't do it. How do you do it instead? Exactly. So the blockchain has to be kept small and fast. And that's something that you learn very quickly. What does that mean, though? It also means that the old infrastructure will not go away. Because you're going to use legacy systems for much of the data for the blockchain, no matter what blockchain you're using. You're going to use legacy systems. I talked to somebody about a year ago who wanted to write a, a, a system for house, the housing market. And they said that, you know, oh, yeah, it's easy. We just put all the data that are currently used for legacy systems in, the, in our blockchain. And I told them that, do you think that the current actors in, the, in this space are going to give up all the data and all the, the money they're making and put it on your blockchain? And he said, yeah, why not? It's cool. Blockchain is cool. And he came back about six months later and said, well, we didn't make it. And I told him, I could have told you that a long time ago. Number and location of peers. This also is the fact that the blockchain has to be, has to keep, have as few peers as possible, as few actors as possible, because they all talk to each other. This is kind of a under the covers here, but there is another thing you have to be aware of. Latency and throughput is another aspect of the amount of data being shared. The more data you have, the worse the latency and the worse the throughput. P performance here is really, really important. And that will, that will guide you in how, the, how you architect the blockchain. Type of data being shared, security, how is identity achieved, confidentiality, who verifies, these are all security issues. Resiliency, resource failure, what happens if the blockchain goes down? Can it go down? Will it be allowed to go down? And non-determinism. Non-determinism is, is the fact that every peer must give the same answer. Whoever you question in the blockchain must give the same answer. So for instance, if you have something that is time, if you say get current time, included, uh, included milliseconds, you will not get the same milliseconds from, the, from whoever you query in the blockchain it will be non-deterministic. In other words, it will not be a clear answer. And that is absolutely forbidden in blockchain. So here are a number of, of questions you have to be aware of and you have to ask, ask them uh, when you architect your system. And this is uh, something that is not really a part of the spec, but should be. So, the, so understanding this thing takes more than just reading the spec. This really, you need a lot of experience as well. And here we have one of my favorites, the Oracle. What is an oracle? Yes, source of truth. Why is that so difficult to get the source of truth? Because of fake news and similar things. So the oracle is a source you go to because you trust the source. Why should you trust the oracle when you don't trust trusted third parties? 
the young man in the, in the end, at the end of the room there. Can you tell us that? The question is, since we, since we know that you cannot trust trusted third parties, that's why we got blockchain to begin with, because we don't want to trust banks, for instance. Why can't we trust an oracle? That's right. There's no other way to get data into the blockchain, and we really can't trust that either. So we have kind of a, a, a question here. We trust certain things, and we don't trust other things. And this may, is what makes the, trust, the trusted oracle kind of an interesting, an interesting um, thing. Chain code is what we write. When we write applications in blockchain, we write chain code or smart contracts. They're just functions. They're very easy to write, no, no, no big deal. If we want to start by doing something new, cool in blockchain, begin to learn smart contracts to write that. In this case, we have Go and Node.js or Java and other languages are coming. But that's something I would really urge you to start with. Forget about the architecture, forget about everything else, but just get your hands dirty, go down and begin to learn to, to write chain code or smart contracts. Not, not difficult to do, and then you can get a very good job maybe through the den. So to supply chain, we talked about that. Here is another important thing. The IBM has a number of methodologies for people who are writing, who are go working in this space. We have the garage method. We have, we have um, active startup speed and enterprise consultant write cloud native. We have cloud native experts. And here we have the blockchain strategy for blockchain services. I would be happy to get some of these people here and talk to you guys about uh, the, these methodologies because they, they are quite important to know them. This is especially agile. How do you write applications quickly in the blockchain space? If there's a call for that, I can easily get somebody here to tell you what that methodology is and show you how to do it. Be aware that IBM is putting almost everything we have out on the web. So although you may not be able to afford our enterprise services, unless you are very rich, then at least you can see what, we do, what they are because they're all documented in detail on the web. So take a look at the web, take a look at what, what, they are, what we are doing in space and learn from the best. And here is another thing. We have 800 of these design patterns, which are sample applications up on the web as well. For not all for blockchain, but for about 40, 50 for blockchain. They are on GitHub, take them on GitHub, fork them and use them as your own. Very, very simple. And we, we love you for doing so. You don't have to begin to create something from scratch again. That's the one thing. Don't create anything from scratch. Take what is out there, reuse it, and it's already been tested. Food trust is one of the major applications IBM has written. Again, being able to search through the food records to see if anybody has in contaminated any food as, as whatsoever. And this, again, is a part of the IBM enterprise applications. We have a number of these applications, and why do we have, the, why is supply chain so important? Let me see if I can show you that. Oops. Nope. Can I go back up? Can I get somebody from the den here? I think I'm coming back up again. No? I thought I would I thought I had a, a chart that I didn't that I stepped past. Can we get back up to the more than to the beginning? A little bit further back. Yeah, okay, keep going. We can go like this, yeah, thank, thank you. So again, uh, why is supply chain so important? Because supply chain are large applications, enormous applications. That is what the, end, the, what the word rests on. For instance, Apple became fam famous and became extremely uh, uh, you know, rich on the supply chain. The same is true on Amazon. It's supply chain, supply chain, supply chain, supply chain. The largest applications in the world are supply chain which is why 
blockchain is targeting supply chain, especially from large companies like IBM. And uh, therefore, you should be aware that that is a good way to learn from IBM and from other companies who are using supply, who are using blockchain for supply chain. So again, we talked about IBM Food Trust. Here again, the idea is that you can take this application, you can tweak, tweak it, and you can use it for your own uses. This is a application that can be bought, installed somewhere, and you know, so bought by you, installed somewhere, and then just customized. And what you do here is you search through it. You can do searches here and to find out if, 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 if the food chain here has been contaminated, and this is saving lives. You can do the same thing. You can take this supply chain and change it to the, to the airplane industry, which is an industry that I am very interested in. So you can see exactly also not where, where food comes from, but where the airplane components come from to see if they have been mishandled, destroyed, or changed in any way. You can use it for any other thing you want to, any other supply chain. They're all interchangeable. It is just a matter of tweaking the knobs and getting another application in there. And that is something that you can, you are in, you, you know, you can buy from IBM and our partners. We have 1,500 industry and technical experts working on blockchain. And TradeLens was the first one application we wrote. And 1,500 industry and technical experts is not a bad number. I mean, it is pretty good. We have the World Wire, which is a different type of, 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 of blockchain, where when I send money to Sweden, which is where I'm from, I have to, it has to go through four banks. And they keep the money for about a week. Here you can do it in a matter of seconds. So you don't only have to do uh, supply chain, you, we also have other, other types of IBM applications. We trade is another one for trading. And blockchain and healthcare, as we talked about, is also very important. Trusted identity. And then we, we have this thing uh, about uh, why do we, where do we make money? If, Hi if Hyperledger is free, how can we make money from Hyperledger? We make money in the cloud. Hosting your app. We can host it in the public cloud, in the cloud private, or in IBM hybrid cloud. And that's where you can get a much better user interface. You can work much faster, much more safely. And you can then take the cloud version of, the, of the, this code and install it in, on your own cloud. And we have a number of blockchain use cases, blockchain solutions. This is where the big push now is, is that Kaushik pointed out, is going on between all the cloud vendors and all the blockchain vendors, a race to the bottom. Cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. It's a very, very big movement. And then we have the hosting hyperledger in the cloud. We have the IBM cloud. We have the IBM pri private cloud. And the IBM is even supporting AWS here, which is kind of, in, you never thought you would see that. Having gone this far, let me ask you, is there anybody who has any questions about using Hyperledger in uh, Hyperledger Fabric for the enterprise? Anybody going to do it? Come on, somebody must. I am doing a big event here in two, two months' time with the IBM blockchain team for enterprise. How many people here would come to such an event? Or oh, everyone would come. Come on, come on. Do you too? Yes. Well, uh, that's a good question. How, what is the smallest uh, application you can write? I think there are two answers to that. First of all, uh, you can write one something very, very small, hello world, writing it on your laptop. And you, nobody would even know it was on your laptop. It's very, very easy to do that. But what you want to do here now really is to learn from the enterprise. And that's not gonna, learn, that's not gonna teach you very much about the enterprise. So uh, after that, I think you should go and begin to learn from the enterprise. In other words, all, every, everything that IBM and others have done in the enterprise is where you can really, really learn the best they really are not small. You know, this is a matter of, of writing, as I said, huge applications. 
and uh, there really is no reason for why you should write a small enterprise application. Kind of, right? I mean, it's, 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 it's enterprise means, means large. Yeah. Yes? I hope, I wish not, nobody would ask me that because I don't know the answer. But I think we can say that it is probably a, it, the prices I would think, I, I don't know, but I mean the pricing I would think is compa very competitive because we have competitors in the space. But it is en at the enterprise level, so it's, it's going to be. I really don't think so much about that. If, I mean, we, we've seen, Kashik showed, you know, we have Oracle, we have a number of others as well, AWS, uh, Microsoft, and for a number of others as well. But um, we seem to be out in front in IBM, and I'm happy we are. And for us, this is one of three, the three most important applications and technologies together with AI and IoT. So this is important for us. Any other questions? So cloud private and Kubernetes pl 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 platform for your enterprise. This is the cloud private. This is where if, like, like for instance, a hospital would put it in the cloud private, they would not never put it in the open, in, in the, uh, open cloud because of course for, for obvious reasons. And here again, you can learn from us uh, by simply looking at the web page and uh, taking a look at what we have. Cloud hosting, uh, blockchain, IBM Cloud, Google Platform, Hyperledger Fabric, a number of competitors here. And um, again, the race for the bottom. IBM Blockchain for AWS. I think we are ahead of the game here over AWS, but I mean, they are giving us a very good run for our money, which is good. And one of the things you need to have on your team is a cloud expert. Because you have to see, uh, you know, if we're starting out on the IBM cloud, we may want to jump to AWS later or vice versa when pr the pricing changes. Because it, there will be very small fluctuations of price and you can then take advantage of that and move part of, of your uh, platform over. And especially since the blockchain is only going to be part of your application, the uh, legacy systems are going to be probably, I would say 75%, if I may guess, of your, of your application will be, le be legacy systems. 25% blockchain. And it's going to be optimized, like you wouldn't believe it, running very, very fast, very, very small blockchain with small amounts of data, pointing out to X-ray images, radiology images, and other data, and putting, the, putting it in, and using oracles for getting you know, the best news and the best information you can. This is a typical cloud platform. And here you can see what you get in the cloud. On the, at the bottom here, you have deployment in the IBM cloud or on-premise or Amazon Web Services. Then we have Hyperledger Fabric, development tools, pre-built industry sample code, DevOps and data integration, one-click network creation, and then operational tools. Multi-party workflow simulation, which is very nice, membership activation. A number uh, of these um, Applications are coming online here, making the environment more and more flexible, easier to use, and much faster. You can, for instance, here, if you know what your way around, you can create an application here very, very quickly, much more quickly than you can in Hyperledger Fabric. Nobody would write a Hyperledger Fabric application today without going to the cloud. You would do it for because, because you, are, you want to learn, but you wouldn't run it there. Actually, that is not quite true. Uh, in Jordan, you know where that is, there is a f refugee crisis and they are using blockchain for helping the refugees running on laptops, using eye scanning, iris scanning to identify the refugees so you, they know who you are, they are, and then uh, g helping them to get food and medical uh, advice and so support and so forth, all running on laptops. So you don't have to have a, a beefy cloud system if you, if you are targeting another market. But on the other hand, most of the market here today is in the cloud. And then we have further information. And that's pretty much what I have. Again, the important thing now is to, to remember that we have a number of these events in IBM 
with um, our team where we can show you and share uh, that you give, access to, give you access to our systems and play around with them and uh, that will be two months from now. I think that's pretty much what I had. <laughs> Anybody who's working on blockchain applications that would like to have some feedback, let me know I may be able to help. And I can pull in other people. Yes. Yes, on LinkedIn. Uh, Lennart Francel. I thought you came because, of, because I was presenting here. Yeah. Uh, actually, this entire presentation has been recorded on our YouTube channel. Yeah. Uh, so once again, thanks a lot, everyone, for coming out. Uh, I hope you enjoy the presentation. You know, between Leonard and Koshik, these guys are amazing. They really know what they're doing. They have a ton of experience. And we're really excited to see what they bring to the table and what they can, you know, showcase to everyone. As we continue with this lecture series, our whole goal is to help you guys build up your knowledge, help you guys get a better grasp of what blockchain is, what's happening in the space, and how you can really use it to impact your life, your companies, uh, or whatever your goals might be. Uh, so with that, I think we're just about done. Uh, it looks like you guys killed all the pizza, so... <laughs> um, that's that, but I hope you guys have a great night. Um, next week, I believe we have blockchain and, and yeah, so the legal, um, the state of the legal and regulatory space with blockchain next week, same time here, live stream and in person, there will be more pizza. So I hope you guys can come out. Um, and with that, everyone have a great night.